God started to speak into my heart about um, that his pattern, the word he spoke was, my pattern for you is to adopt. And I was like, what? I mean, this is, what is God talking about? You know, it's not my idea. And people are going to say they're going to laugh at us and we have biological children. We can have more biological children. We're good at that. We have no problem, you know? And God started to speak this into our heart. And it happened because we started praying these crazy prayers. We started going to this church in Rockham County. And it was good, solid Bible teaching. And my husband said to me at one point in time, you know what, Christianity is a really lousy habit. It's a stupid hobby if you don't really believe in the power of God. Amen. He was just like, look, there's a lot better stuff we can be doing with our Sundays if we are not really going to believe God. I mean, you know, that, that's that distinction, right? You know, the majority of Americans say, I believe in God. But, but you leave out the end and everything changes, right? Do you believe God? And so Doug was like, this is a stupid hobby if we're only just going to go play church and walk around and say we believe in God. Oh, great, congratulations. You're part of a social group that meets on Sunday and is not affecting the rest of your life. So Doug started really challenging me. I didn't really like it very much. <laughs> he started saying, like, you know what? If we're supposed to honor God with our money, we're going to start honoring God with our money. That's the first thing we're going to do every month. I'm like, what do you know about the bills? Because I've been the bills right. You have an idea. I don't know how we're going to pay this. I don't know how we're going to do this. He's like, look, let's just try God. He said, let's just see. What does it say in Malachi? Test me in this. Try me. See if I will not pour out more blessing than what you can handle. He said, you know, either we're going to believe him or let's quit this. If something is a challenge in front of us or something is unsettling or we're worried about it. I am the person who's like, well, I'm going to trust God. But Doug lives in this space that's way beyond that in faith. And he's like, I can't wait to see what God is going to do. Do you see the difference there? I'm going to trust God. And I'm going to worry, worry, worry. And I have a lot of other things. And I'm going to lay in some... You know, some safety nets and I'm gonna, <laughs> right? But I believe God. But Doug, he's like, this is gonna be so cool. We are gonna see God move. And I mean, don't you know that honors the Lord to live in that place, that forward place of I I am in anticipation. I'm not in hoping you're gonna come through. Hope you will, but in case you don't, I'm getting ready to build in some safety. <laughs> no, no, no. We're not going to waste our energy on that anymore. The kingdom is advancing. We live forward. Well, what happens is it spills over into all of the relationships of our lives. People get uncomfortable. People around us get uncomfortable. They think you're going crazy. They want to help you figure out why you're crazy or how you can improve or what would be a wiser choice than moving to China or adopting eight children. But what it does is, is that it creates a heritage in our children. And it creates for them the opportunity. You know, one of the reasons all we're, we're losing all these people when they get out of the house and go to college is because they've never had to use their own faith muscles. They're just like weaklings. They've just been force fed, force fed, force fed. And they have, in many cases, become professional Christians like I was. But they got no muscle mass. So when the enemy comes forward, and he does, is the promise, the enemy's going to come for us. They have nothing to fight back with. So what we, what we started to do then, when things started getting crazy and God starts changing our whole life, is we started incorporating our kids in it. Now there's a whole school of thought that says, don't worry your kids and don't tell them about any issues. But I say, if we are the children of the living God, and we are living forward in the space, which is, I can't wait to see what God's going to do about this, 
then all you're doing is creating a testimony for your children. Your children need to see God move. They need to pray for the problems so that they can see God move, so that they have their own muscles of faith. Is that true, Natalie? Yeah. They have to see it. And if you practice that, well, I just wanted to have an idyllic childhood. I don't want to ever have, I'm not mocking that because I was there for a long time. But I'm telling you, that's a deception of the enemy. Because what we're doing is we're creating a fallacy for our children. Life is not idyllic. Anybody know that? And the enemy is coming for your children. Did you know that? Absolutely. And the more you press into God, he's coming harder for your kids. So the more you try to protect the I, idyllic lifestyle and not let them know of any troubles, you are robbing them of seeing a great God move. So I really want to encourage you with your children that when anything, that, that it is, as Debbie said, that we talk about God all the time. And you know what? God is the answer to everything. And in every circumstance in your life, God wants to be a player. He wants to be the player in your life in that circumstance. And as a parent, we have got to help our children identify I once heard this message from my, my pastor, a friend, I loved it. He said, we need to have generous eyes towards God. We need to always be looking for what he's doing. Debbie's so good at this. She's always going to use it too. I think I see God moving here. I think I see him moving here. You need to do the same. And then, not just notice it for yourself, but you need to tell your children, look what God did. Did you see God move? And so when we have a big issue... In our family, we need, uh, you know, our support is lacking. We need $5,000. The conventional way that I was raised is we would never tell the kids we don't want them to worry. But what we do is we have a prayer meeting. We get everybody in the living room and we say, we need $5,000. Who has $5,000? Who has $5,000? God does, right? So I need you all to ask with us, Lord, we need $5,000 for this. Could you help us? I get everybody praying. Get Ezra praying. Get every, every, Ezra's not the youngest at home right now. But everybody's going to pray about it. And then, surprise, surprise, something happens. I get some letters. We just got $5,000. And you know what I do? We have a prayer meeting. We get together and we look at, look at what God did. What does God do? He listens. What does he do? He answers us. And then my kids, I hear them saying at school, yeah, we have this need and we ask God for it and he responded. My daughter Naomi, who's adopted from China, has been searching for her birth family. She desperately wanted to know who her birth parents are. The chance of finding birth parents in China is like, I don't even know how many hundreds and thousands to one. <laughs> But we found her birth family last year. And you know what her first response was? He heard me. He heard me pray every night about that, and he responded. It wasn't just, gee, I'm lucky, or isn't this great? She immediately gave praise to God. Because that is the source of every good thing that comes into our household. So that is, even, I go to Costco. I go to Costco, which is a, the talk about spiritual warfare. I go to Costco. I try to fight off the desire to consume everything and take everything home to feather my nest. But if I get a good parking space, which means I don't have to carry Ezra so far, or the wheelchair doesn't have to go so far, what do I say? Look who the Lord gave to us. <laughs> 